So in general, we've seen that the effective population size for um, a population that's undergoing um, sexual reproduction with different sexes or where selection is going on or the population size is fluctuating, in general, the effective population size is less than the actual population size. So what that means is basically populations act smaller than they really are in terms of um, the number of individuals, if you were just to calculate them, calculate something called the census size. And so that means that this value of f goes up faster, and um, genetic diversity is lost. Now there is a slight exception to this. So we saw one exception if we didn't allow selfing, but that was quite minor. There is an exception when it comes to selection. So in general, with selection, so we're thinking about consistently unequal reproduction. In general, if we have selection, it's actually like the other factors, where the effective population size would be less than the actual population size. But if we have some sort of selection that ends up causing roughly equal reproduction, or essentially reproduction that is more equal between different entities than would be expected just by a random process, under those conditions, the effective population size can actually be larger than the census population size. And this is actually why, for example, in zoos, who are charged with the conservation of endangered species and are concerned about the genetic diversity of their individuals, they'll actually keep track of um, family trees and the reproduction of all these captive animals to ensure that no one animal ends up doing more reproduction than others, even if it's more fertile or healthy, because that would cause the overall effective population size of these zoo animals to be less than the number of animals. Instead, what they'll do is they'll try to ensure that every individual of that species in captivity is able to reproduce and as equally as possible, because that will have the effect of causing the effective population size of that captive population to be larger than the actual population size, which means that they'll lose their genetic diversity more slowly than if things were random. And this is something we want, right? If we have captive populations that are endangered, we want them to maintain their genetic diversity for as long as possible. And we're kind of all waiting for that magical day when we're able to like fix the world and re-release them back into the wild. But until that point, we want to maintain their genetic diversity while they are in captivity. And to return to this idea, the effective population size smaller than the actual population size, this is in increasing. And the overall point here is that all the effects of stochasticity, this randomness, they're more severe in smaller populations. And so we can, um, let's draw a little diagram and think about um, kind of a pictorial example. Let's think about four entities that are reproducing over time. They'll reproduce um, randomly. So this one will make a copy of itself for the next generation. This one will get lucky, make two copies of itself. Uh, this one will just be unlucky and fail to reproduce. And this one will make a copy of itself. Right? So this is not that necessarily this one's better than this one, just kind of random chance. Now let's think about the next generation. Uh, maybe this one will be the unlucky one. This one here is the lucky one, reproduces twice. And then these guys kind of reproduce themselves once. And then among these four, let's think about uh, maybe this one's the unlucky one and this one's the lucky one. And then these guys kind of just reproduce themselves. And so if we think about our entities with some that fail to reproduce and some that randomly reproduce um, more than once, we would get some sort of pattern like this. And the interesting thing about a pattern like this is if we look at all these individuals here and we kind of identify this population here. In the previous generation, they descended from these individuals. And those individuals in the previous generation descended from these. And those actually both descended from those. So what we can actually see has happened in this diagram here is that from the initial set of four entities, just by random factors, one of these entities has fixed in the population, has been the only, has become, the only entity remaining. 
So this randomness, or stochasticity, um, in this example, caused, but in general, will cause one allele to fix any time we have a set of alleles or entities, one of them will end up being the one that fixes because each generation by random chance, some are being lost. Now if we go back to this initial set, if we were to go and pick any of these alleles, what's the probability of them fixing? Well, since they're all kind of equally likely to randomly reproduce and randomly be lost, the probability of fixing will just be equal to whatever the frequency is in the beginning. And so if we think about a population now of individuals, of diploid individuals, if we pick one allele in a population of n individuals, the probability of that allele fixing is 1 over 2n. Right? 2n because that's the number of alleles if you have a diploid population of size n. And then this doesn't happen instantly, right? It takes a number of generations for this to occur. So the time in order for this whole process to occur, going from a single copy until the point at which um, it's fixed in the population, um, we won't do a derivation or anything, but it turns out the time is 4n, 4n generations to fix. So anytime you have a bunch of alleles in a population, one of them is going to end up being the one that fixes. If you randomly choose one of the alleles, the probability the one you choose being the one that fixes is 1 over 2n, and then it actually takes 4n generations for that to occur. So after 4n generations, the population would be monomorphic, or all homozygous for the same allele, although as we saw um, previously, mutations by creating new alleles constantly prevent the population from becoming completely the same. But let's think about one of the aspects of what just happened. Let's think about the loss of the alleles that we had each generation. And we can actually put a number on how many of them are lost. So if we think about what's happening in our reproduction, we're having a stable population. So each generation, 2n alleles are chosen. So we're kind of thinking about a scenario here where we have a population. There's a bunch of alleles in this population, right? Remember, we have our pan mictic population. It's making the next generation. And the way we're visualizing this happening is this new population, those alleles are kind of randomly chosen from the alleles here. So we randomly choose an allele here, and that reproduces. Randomly choose another one, and that reproduces. Randomly choose another one, and that reproduces randomly choose another one, it could be the same one again, and it would actually um, be copied twice. And by the time we go through and do this, some of these won't be chosen, some of these will be chosen more than once when we make our new population. Now, how many are lost? In each generation, two n of these alleles are chosen, but again, some can be duplicates. Each time there's one chosen, there's a one over two n probability of being chosen, um, each time, right? Each time one of these alleles is picked, it's got a one over two n probability of being chosen if we focus on one of those alleles. So, what's the probability that an allele is not chosen, right, at all? So, those two n choices occur, and an allele is not chosen. Well. It's the probability that it wasn't chosen the first time, right? So if 1 over 2n is the probability of being chosen, 1 over 2n is the probability of not being chosen. And then during this reproduction, we were choosing 2n alleles. So in order for it not to be chosen at all, it has to not be chosen 2n times. Um, now you've actually seen an equation kind of like this before when you took your calculus class. Um, let's just go back to calculus. The limit as x goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over x raised to the power x ends up being 1 over e. And that's what we have here, right? 1 minus 1 over 2n raised to the power 2n. If the population becomes large, that's exactly the same thing as this, which means 
this probability for any given allele of not being chosen in a generation is 1 over e. e is 2.7 something, and so this number is going to end up being uh, about 0.368. So what does that mean? That means in each generation where this kind of random choice of alleles is going on, about 40% of all the alleles are lost. So you have a population with a whole bunch of alleles. Each generation, about 40% of those alleles are not going to make it to the next generation. And that's per generation. So that gets compounded over time. So we can actually see how, even if we start with a very diverse population, we can end up with not a lot of different types of alleles um, after a period of time. And one of the things in particular is that even good alleles can be lost. So this process of alleles not being chosen, that even applies to advantageous alleles. Now they're a little bit more likely to be chosen, so they're a little less likely to not be chosen. But it is still possible for advantageous alleles to be lost. There's no guarantee that they're the ones that are actually going to fix.